everyone. Welcome to this GMF conversation organizing uh, cooperation with COTS, the Center for Applied Turkish Studies at SWP uh, Stiftung Wissenschaft and Politik in, uh, in Berlin. My name is Kadir Tashtan and it's really my great pleasure to moderate this discussion. Today we will share with you the uh, preliminary finding of a report titled The Syrian Crisis, March 2016 Turkey-EU uh, deal and the perception of European and Turkish stakeholders. The report is written for cuts. Unfortunately, the report has not been published yet. It will be published in coming days or weeks. Uh, this is why we couldn't share with you apologies for this. And I'm sure the author of the report will give you uh, some more details about this. So let me first to mention that this event is organized as part of the project perception of the European and the Turkish decision makers of the Syrian crisis, which is a project of COTS network, which is funded by uh, Stiftung Mercator and the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. This, is, this online event is also part of a series of events and analyze organized as part of GMF TOBB, a fellowship on Turkey, Europe and global issues launched by GMF in partnership with the TOBB in 2016. But it's obvious that the migration issue uh, has started to occupy a central place in the relations between Turkey and the EU since the, uh, particularly this migration crisis of 2015. And it has even partly changed the nature of uh, their relationship. The migration topic is also becoming a really central, central to the political debate in several European countries. And currently we can observe this in the French presidential campaign that has just started. So the crisis between Ankara and Greece in February 2020, the recent crisis on the Polish Belarusian border and the crisis in Calais in the north of France, which, which created tension between France and the UK. I mean, all this example shows how the issue of migration is becoming a sensitive one. So obviously there are many things to discuss and today we gathered a very uh, good group of experts and speakers uh, to discuss all to uh, all this uh, with you. Please let me first to introduce uh, our speakers. We have two ambassadors with us today. Uh, we have uh, Ambassador Yannis Fralias, permanent uh, representative of Greece to the EU. Ambassador, welcome. Uh, we have uh, Ambassador uh, Mehmet Kemal Bozay, permanent delegate of Turkey to the EU. Ambassador, we ve uh, very welcome. And then we have three authors of the reports. We have Professor Murat Erdogan, uh, who is a professor at the, uh, at the Turkish German University. We have Nihal Aminoğlu, assistant professor and lecturer at the Çanakkale on Sekizmar University in Turkey. And uh, Laura Bataya Adam, Adam uh, secretary general of EU Turkey Forum. So uh, welcome. Uh, we have also two distinguished discussants today with us. We have Günther uh, Zoifer. Uh, Günther is the head of COTS, the Center for Applied Turkish Turkish Study at SWP. And we have also uh, uh, Professor Kemal Kirishchi, who is a non-resident center senior fellow with the Brookings. He will join us a bit later. So welcome, Günther. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us. And it's, it's really great to have you all. We will pr proceed in three steps. First of all, I will give the floor to the two ambassadors to have their views about the famous migration deal of 2016 and the future of cooperation in this field between the EU and Turkey. Secondly, the three authors of the report will present their finding briefly. And after presentation, I will give the floor to our two discussants to get their first reaction and their point of view. And of course, at the end, we will open the debate for all of you in the Q&A. Just to say that this is on the record, and if you like to put a question there, are, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window, and we will keep track them, and we will get as many of you as we can. So then, without wasting any more time, I would like to give the floor to Ambassador Vralias. Ambassador, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you, uh, even briefly, some of our thoughts on the uh, EU-Turkey uh, joint uh, statement. Um, we, we truly believe that honest and open dialogue between all parties concerned is, uh, um, is critical if an agreement is to work. Um, and therefore, if we, ha if, if we want to be honest, we have to admit that the statement 
has delivered some uh, very good results, but it has not, also not been working to its full potential uh, to both uh, sides' uh, dissatisfaction. Um, I will not address today uh, Turkey's uh, griefs on the more political aspects of the, uh, of the statement uh, relating to the wider spectrum of EU-Turkey uh, relations, uh, simply because this would take a lot more time than the, than the one that you have uh, very kindly uh, offered me. Um, but I'd be happy to engage on these issues uh, in the framework of another panel uh, in the future. Uh, I would, I would just submit to you that uh, there is not one single EU member state that would ideally, ideally not wish to see Turkey come really closer to the EU than uh, Greece. And I, I will leave it at that for the, for the purposes of this, uh, of this particular uh, dimension of the problem. Um, but now, having said that, I will offer you uh, some more specific consideration on the migration file. The, the easiest thing for me would be to get involved in the trading of, uh, of accusations. Um, I can give you numbers on the inadequate control of borders and the steady flow of departures. I can counter in detail the allegations of pushbacks, uh, including with what we call the push forwards. Um, could refer to the fact that returns are not accepted since 2020, uh, that the Turkish Coast Guard refuses to speak to the, their Greek uh, counterparts. Um, I could uh, delve into last year's unprecedented, at the time, events at the EU-Turkish border, which have, uh, have drawn uh, unflattering uh, parallels in recent months. Um, or on the questions of whether Turkey is a safe country for migrants and refugees. But I truly believe that the situation warrants uh, a more constructive focus and uh, discourse. My main uh, message to you today is the need to realize that Turkey and the EU are communicating vessels when it comes to illegal or irregular migration. The more arrivals Turkey has, the larger the flows into the EU, mostly through Greece. And vice versa, successful illegal arrivals into the EU constitute probably the biggest pull factor for human smuggling into Turkey. Let me throw some numbers at you here. After a certain period of low flows in 2017 and 2018, so immediately after the, the, the joint statement was, was adopted, numbers started again to grow, reaching in uh, 2019 the highest level of approximately 75,000 illegal arrivals to Greece. It is not a coincidence that in the same year, arrivals to Turkey also broke a record with more than 450,000, which amply confirms the link of you know, the communicating vessels theory that I, uh, I referred to earlier. Imagine for just one second in the same vein, what the consequences would have been for Turkey itself as well, uh, in terms of pull factor and its consequences, if Greece had not uh, held strong at the border during the events at the Evros region. Therefore, to go back to the positive, uh, to the positive uh, track, Turkey should have every interest in keeping illegal arrivals into Europe low, and Europe should have every interest in assisting Turkey to contribute to this end. But even more important than what I think, what I personally think, these are the firm views of my government and of my Minister for Migration, who visited Ankara a couple of weeks ago and had some very useful exchanges there with his counterpart, Ms. Minister Soylu. This was followed up by a conversation between the Secretary Generals of the two ministries. And the hope here is that by talking to one another, we will be able to concentrate on what unites us rather than on what divides us, and that we will join forces in dealing effectively with what is our common challenge stemming the flows of irregular migrants. We view Turkey as an important partner for the EU in many areas, including migration. We recognize and appreciate its efforts in hosting a very large refugee and migrant population. And therefore, it is only natural that the EU should support Turkey with financial assistance and capacity building, including in the area of border management. Greece has repeatedly expressed its support to the full implementation of the 2016 joint statement as a viable framework of cooperation between the, the EU and Turkey on migration. For our part, we have never played any political games with migrants and refugees. We are satisfied that since the statement was agreed, 
the EU has made available 6 billion euros to Turkey, providing cash assistance to the refugees, as well as to enhance educational facilities and capacity, access to healthcare, and opportunities for improving livelihoods through numerous language and vocational training programs, while also supporting border protection projects. True to its word, the EU has already adopted decisions covering the period up to 2023 and remains committed in supporting Turkey, both in the area of border protection as well as of migration management. We hope that Turkey will consider doing its best as provided for in the joint statement in preventing migratory flows and accepting returns of those not entitled to international protection. In conclusion, I will reiterate that we all shame the, share the same interest in bringing the overall numbers of irregular migration down. The EU as a whole, and Greece in particular, we are determined to support Turkey in that endeavor, expecting that this will be duly reciprocated. And again, I, I look forward to, to engaging with you on other issues related to these files, on the, the, you know, the, the wider file of EU-Turkey relations in the future. And I apologize that I will not be able to stay for too long because I need to rush back to the General Affairs Council. We are preparing the European Council meeting of tomorrow and after tomorrow. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. Thanks uh, uh, for sharing your thought with us and also uh, uh, for joining us today. And uh, I'm sorry that you cannot stay uh, with us further, but hope to see you again. Thank you. So, Ambassador uh, Bozai, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Kadri, uh, distinguished professors, uh, distinguished ambassador, dear Yanis, it's great to see you. And at the outset, I would like to uh, congratulate all the participants and the uh, reporters, let's say, I'm sure that it is a very valuable report because we need to uh, have these evaluations uh, for the sake of Turkey relations and for the sake of the agreement and the deal. Again, at the beginning, I would like to underline that Turkey's accession to the European Union is a challenging and at the same time strategic and invaluable vision. And also as Yanis underlined, uh, we see that uh, Greece is also uh, having uh, cooperation in this uh, direction uh, in, in many cases. There are some, uh, you know, uh, controversial issues, but as diplomats, this is what they pay for us and we do our best to uh, have uh, the better dialogue as Yanis also uh, emphasized the visit of the uh, minister in Ankara. It was a very fruitful, very successful visit. Uh, what, whatever the case, uh, the, there will be ups and downs. And as uh, the late uh, President Özal said, this is a bumpy road. But in this bumpy road, 18 March agreement in 2016 is also an important juncture. Uh, but uh, I'm a bit uh, derived from Yanis comments because it is also not limited to migration cooperation, but includes re-energizing the accession process uh, uh, on a legal basis, customs union, uh, regular high-level dialogues, visa liberalization, and counterterrorism. As uh, Yanis uh, mentioned, we can have another discussion on this in another session in the coming days. However, the reflection of the uh, 18 March, we see some high-level dialogues on various fields. This is also part of this deal. And uh, considering the current challenges, elaborating uh, the 2016 agreement in its entirety will be in the best interest of uh, not only Turkey, and but uh, also EU, and for the wider region. Uh, the emergence of a geostrategic EU has a crucial connection with it, which can fulfill all its objectives, uh, membership created as uh, the relations ameliorate. Uh, 18 March agreement, uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, uh, still some member states are reluctant on increasing resettlement quotas and while trying to strike a balance uh, between border protection and humanitarian concerns. Uh, this uh, agreement still seems to be the most important component of uh, the EU migration policy as well. Even this alone is a sign of importance given to Turkey's role and the success of 18 March agreement, which was a game changer for the management of refugee crisis, as well as a lifesaver for the irregular migrants. We should not forget that the agreement saved lives you remember the baby on the shores of AGNC, have broken many illegal trafficking and migrants, migrant smuggling networks and was the right step to replace 
irregular immigration with the manageable immigration. Although, as I mentioned, it included some other issues uh, uh, like customs union and other visa liberalization, as uh, for the sake of the today's discussion, I will uh, concentrate on the migratory dimension as the report is also concentrated on, as far as I understand, uh, for this dimension. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the main aim to deal with migratory flows is to be able to analyze the problems at the origin of the flow. 10 years after the Syrian conflict has started and five years after the 18 March deal, uh, we should uh, also need to work more and we should focus on betterment of humanitarian conditions within the Syrian border. And uh, I'm sure in detail there will be some discussions on how it is applied. There are some systems on Friday, we will have a steering committee of it, and we will have some more discussions how to run it. And there will be a change in this financial mechanism of it. But here I would like to uh, bring to your attention the Article 8 of the agreement, which reads the EU and its member states will work with Turkey in a joint endeavor to improve humanitarian conditions inside Syria, in particular in certain areas near the Turkish border, which would allow for the local population and refugees to live in areas which will be more safe. This is uh, the, uh, this should be another item that our discussion should uh, concentrate on, because you know we have three million in a pocket. There are one hundred uh, one million eight million uh, internally displaced people at the border. Though we have almost four million Syrians and one million other uh, nationalities, uh, we have also another four million next door to us, and this uh, four million. Uh, is also uh, some kind of uh, part of the steel because if they would there would be a flow uh, then it will be really really a catastrophic for Turkey and of course for the EU and at the end of the day the neighboring countries EU members uh, will have uh, will be suffering from this and then uh, we need to uh, concentrate how we can do things together in the scope of this article 9. Uh, and uh, our discussions uh, should concentrate on that. Frit, now, as I mentioned, uh, this uh, uh, Frit, uh, we get, uh, we, we are having some projects, already 4.2 billion euros, 70% of the promised number of six, uh, three plus uh, three billion have been dispersed. And, uh, and also Turkey spent four, two billion US dollars for the Syrian refugees. Uh, the, and since the conflict has started, this is also compared to Turkey's uh, contribution. It is uh, also a good uh, way of co uh, cooperation, but it is uh, not the same uh, level of, of Turkey's uh, burden sharing. Uh, and we know that uh, the, 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 for Turkey, a meaningful, meaningful cooperation should include uh, extension of uh, financial aid and also joint projects because joint projects are very important because there are two uh, main uh, projects which are for the integration and some others are for the returns. And to have the burden on Turkey and just to have concentration on reintegration uh, is not a very fruitful approach. We should also consider the returns when we have 450,000 uh, refugee uh, Syrian uh, people uh, are back to uh, Syria voluntarily dignified and safe way. And there we need to work on all these things. And briefly, Yanis also mentioned about pushbacks, push forwards. There was a commercial of Kodak sent more than words. I don't want to make any speculation on that, but there are some media reports, media coverages, and the participants can see and make their own mind about what is going on and what are the main parts of this, I mean, allegations and uh, they, they can make their own mind about these allegations. One important element I would like to uh, also underline is the attitude of the parliament, European parliament. Because when there is a problem with Turkey, they immediately talk about cutting the money to Turkey and to say that we shouldn't provide any money related with Syrians. And this is, you know, this money doesn't go to the pocket of Turkish government. This goes directly to the projects and the pocket of the Syrians. And there is, this um, you know impression in the parliament i divide this impression to two some are uh, really thinking that this money is going to turkey some are unfortunately 
in a very uh, hidden way. They say that Turks have the old burden. So why we are going to pay, uh, pay more money to Turkey? And in this parliament, this attitude should be also considered well. And it, this is also our duty to uh, bring this to uh, the attention of the public to say that uh, this is also uh, some uh, uh, misperception uh, uh, on purpose or without purpose. I don't know, but there is a on purpose part of it as well. And there are some funds, you know, uh, instrument for pre-accession. Uh, and in this uh, pre-accession uh, funds, IPA funds, they, when there are problems, it's also uh, cut from there. And then immediately the first reaction in the EU is cutting from IPA. But you know, especially there seems uh, uh, to, uh, to be there seems to be less support given the institution building efforts on sex sectors such as home affairs and judiciary. These sectors are very prominent in coping with the Syrians and other uh, uh, problems related with migration, refugees generated from the huge influx of population. A loss of confidence to the EU in these sectors could also be. Uh, very problematic in the long run, and IPA projects are for uh, also part of uh, this cooperation, I believe, in a way. Uh, and uh, in conclusion, I would uh, like to say uh, you maybe uh, the report will address, I don't know, so many issues, but this is a living document. 18 March uh, deal is a living document, and it is changing according to the uh, you know, change in uh, on the ground, and even it gave a birth to uh, pact. I think we we lost the uh, ambassador. Uh, yes, I think we have a technical issue here. Can you hear me? Maybe me, I am disconnected. Ah, this is no, okay. No, no. Uh, yeah, this, I'm uh, other, we, we yeah I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, we to make it more exciting, I, I cut it myself. <laughs> we <laughs> lost you to think that I'm saying something and I put the <laughs> silent mood. <laughs> That's great. great. Please, we didn't. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, just wanted to, I just wanted to clarify it was not me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I would like to bring and, and, and some. I mentioned about this technical parts of this 18 March still, and I mentioned that it gave birth to another document, this pact. And this pact is very important. But I see a danger here. There are two concepts that I would like to underline. Fortress Europe and Great Replacement. Now I see that in some countries, in some EU countries, uh, which are in, on the eve of elections, they are, the, the candidates are talking about Great Replacement. I don't want to get, go to the details of what Great Replacement means, but this is very dangerous. And then Great Replacement, to, pre uh, to prevent great replacement, to turn Europe into fortress, uh, uh, into a fortress, is uh, not an uh, exact uh, the the uh, the, con the exact concept that for, uh, founding fathers of uh, European Union were uh, thinking. And, and I believe that there are some problems. And Kadri, you also at the beginning mentioned what uh, uh, problems at the border. And we are also with uh, our neighboring countries, including Greece, we are talking about these things. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we should be very careful uh, that EU policies, which are based on lessons learned from 18 March deal, should cause an iron curtain, a steel curtain, which will isolate Turk, uh, EU from uh, other parts of the world if EU would like to be geopolitical. And, you know, I know that the founding fathers did not have the union of steel and uh, coal to have steel walls, but in order to have welfare, stability, and peace in the wider region of Europe. And this part of migration and the lessons learned from 18 March should be taken into consideration in that direction. I'm not talking about demographics and other things because there are also some discussions saying that aging population, EU, the EU countries need some uh, immigrants in order to survive in future. This might be correct or not, because it depends on the numbers and it depends on digital uh, agenda and green transformation will provide new labor uh, systems that might uh, decrease the need of uh, Europe for labor. But I believe the main thing not to be away from the universal values of the EU. 
This is the EU Turkey would like to be a member. EU uh, Turkey doesn't want to be a member without having these values and trying to be a fortress uh, inside. You know, there is also some uh, co concepts uh, like border state. Turkey, we say that the borders of EU starts from Turkey's borders. And then some others say Turkey is only in a, in a way after this migration, just to block the migration. Uh, and then to, to, to be only a partner, just to have a migration deal. Uh, that is all for Turkey. There is no way Turkey to have some membership uh, perspective. Uh, this is uh, two way. You know, if you see a country for blocking the immigration, on the other way, it might be blocking EU to have geopolitical openings. And instead of doing this, we need to cooperate well and migration and the lessons learned from 8 March document, which is a living document, should be a guidance for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Bozai. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. And thanks again, uh, Ambassador Railas. And uh, uh, now I would like to move to the second step uh, of our meeting, where uh, the authors, they will present us the, briefly the findings. So uh, for this, uh, I will give the floor to Professor Erdogan. Uh, we are, yes, please just make it full screen. Is it okay now? Oh, uh, not yet. No, we have the exactly the same issue that we had during the oh. exercise. Sorry, I'm thinking one more time. I think now I find it out. Now it must Great. come. Yes, over to you, uh, Professor. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the meeting and then Kadri uh, for GMF, of course, for the support of Shiston uh, Kvevesinshaft on politic chats and then Junta. And then thank you, ambassadors. Uh, it was really very nice, very good to, to hear you. And we have also a lot, of, um, a lot of aspect of this issue. And because of that, it's also for us uh, very valuable to hear you also. And um, I have a presentation, uh, but uh, uh, let me introduce my team, first of all. We have a very, um, very good team, actually. And uh, Nihal Eminoğlu from uh, 18 March University. Don't worry, it is this 18 March is not 18 March deal, but it is also really very interesting. It's also university name in, in Turkey, in Çanakkale. And uh, she was also our uh, project coordinator. Laura Batara, as you know, uh, she is uh, general secretary of uh, EU Turkey Forum. Onur Unutulmaz uh, from Ankara so Social Sciences University. And also uh, Frederik Putman. Uh, he is now in Istanbul in uh, uh, IPC. And he is also a PhD candidate in the London School of Economics. Uh, thanks to all. Uh, they gave uh, a lot of effort uh, for, the, uh, for the project. Uh, of course, I have to uh, say my apologize for the report. Uh, I have to write it. And then the, the last point, I had a lot of trouble and then some technical problem. And because of that, I didn't finish. But um, in a week, at least uh, 10 days, uh, you will see also our final report. And I will uh, explain something. But first of all, I will give floor to uh, Nihal. Nihal will explain our uh, very briefly our methodology. Then I will uh, give you an overview. Uh, after my overview, I will give also floor to Laura. Uh, she will give also uh, some uh, input in our uh, European uh, participants. And then I will give, uh, lastly, our policy recommendation. And then we try to cover all of them in 15 minutes. And then now, uh, Nihal, you can, uh, you are, uh, you can give uh, our uh, uh, methodology and then the other uh, detail, please. Hello, everyone. Murat Ojan, thank you so much for giving me the floor. Uh, and uh, please, as a coordinator and a member of the project, let me also thank, uh, first of all, GMF for hosting this event. Uh, of course, CATS for being a partner of 
the project and supporting the research in each step. And of course, uh, our distinguished uh, guests for being with us today, especially both keynote speakers, ambassadors. It's a great pleasure to have all you here. Um, actually, what is the research about? The research is about uh, uh, the perceptions of decision makers. We try to understand the pers perspectives and perce uh, perceptions of the decision makers about the Turkey cooperation on the Syria crisis. Of course, uh, when we say uh, Turkey cooperation and Syria crisis, it has many dimensions. And we summarized it in four uh, important area concept and motivation of the Turkey EU deal. Uh, it was the first dimension. Turkish and EU politics vis-a-vis -vis Syrian refugees in Turkey was the second dimension. We looked at also the Turkey cooperation on the future of the Syria, for Syria, their cooperation in the Syria, in Syria, that was the third uh, dimension. And also we try to understand the effects, the impact of EU-Turkey relationship uh, so, as you all know, there are many, many other instruments under this EU-Turkey relationship. And we had, we interpreted the concept of decision makers in a broad sense, and we defined it as the frontline actors who had a direct or indirect impact on policies and who also who implement strategies. So we try to, uh, yeah, in, in that sense, we try to keep our understanding a large version and uh, hopefully we managed it. Uh, our methodology is based uh, on a desk review and primary data collection. We had an advantage to uh, be a multinational and multilingual uh, team. So in Turkish, English, German, French, and Spanish, we, uh, we, uh, we checked the academic paper official documents and legal instruments and we had a, a very good uh, literature review in that sense for primary data collection first we organized semi-structured in-depth interviews with key informants we conducted uh, conducted these interviews in four important areas which are also crucial for turkey relationship and the syria crisis first of course brussels with eu institutions uh, in berlin of course cats was there role of germany is very well known in Turkey relationship and also in the migration management process of the EU. Strasbourg was very crucial for us because we also had an advantage to meet an important actors in the Council of Europe, uh, which is not EU, of course, but which has also very important effects uh, in, in this uh, process. And in Turkey, uh, mainly in Ankara and Istanbul, we were planning to be in these locations. Uh, but of course, because of the pandemic, we tried to manage all of these interviews uh, in an online format. In total, we, uh, we reached 70 interviews. Uh, 20 of them are Turkish and the rest are uh, from the other um, uh, European countries. Uh, main dimension of the questionnaire divided into four, as I already mentioned, the Turkey EU statement, Turkey and EU uh, cooperation in Turkey for the future of the refugees, their cooperation in Syria. And uh, we also try to understand what our decision makers, stakeholders think about the new pact, EU's new pact on asylum and migration. So that was also the fourth dimension in our questionnaire. It was not easy to, of course, analyze all of them. And we were four different experts working for different areas, but we try to very uh, well organize structured templates. Uh, and I think that was that also really worked well. Of course, these are very detailed uh, uh, parts. So in Q&A, if you need more about the methodology, we could share it with you. Uh, and reporting, uh, Murat Hoca already mentioned that we are uh, coming to the end of the reporting. It was not easy, but we also uh, tried to make it much more difficult for us uh, to get the good quality because our report is not only including the uh, findings of this research, but there is also a historical background of Turkey relations and the short information notes about all these migration management process and the uh, uh, effects of Syria crisis in this process. Uh, besides, uh, we will publish it in two languages, Turkish and English, uh, and there will be policy paper. And what we already decided to do also with CATS team is to or prepare an information kit for university students. Uh, most probably it's going to be in Turkish. And with the, there will be a short summary of the Turkey relations, the migration phenomenon, and plus uh, the outcomes uh, and the findings of our research. We think that this is also additional, this will be also additional value to interpret 
redraft our reports and funding academic rep uh, report for uh, students in Turkey as well. If it will work well, why not the uh, other in other languages for uh, other European uh, countries? We are also thinking about it as well. So uh, this is what I could say in a short time for methodology. And now I would like to give again the floor to Murat Hoca for, uh, for talking about the findings. Thank you, Hoca. Okay. Thank you, Nihal. Now, uh, I would like to give an overview about the refugee situation in Turkey. We are all uh, actually experts uh, on, on uh, migration and the refugees, but uh, the, the same time we are, we are also experts on the European issue. And because of that, uh, this subject is for us not only a migration issue, but also important the Turkish EU relationship. And the, the situation in Turkey is uh, since 2011, very critical. And then as you know, uh, in 2011, we had in Turkey altogether 58,000 refugees and then now over 4 million. We are talking about over 4 million. And then we have a very difficult uh, region and then this region create also uh, very often uh, the, the problems and then the problem, the, one of the biggest problems we live together with Europeans since 2011. The number of the Syrians in Turkey under temporary protection is 3.7 million. It is last four years, the, the, almost the same numbers. Uh, only the newborn babies in Turkey, their numbers is over 700,000. It makes sense. And then the, because of that, the numbers is more um, and then uh, somehow stable uh, because the Turkish government give also citizenship to the Syrians and uh, around 180,000 uh, Syrians get till now this citizenship. And then around 100,000, they live in Turkey with resident permits, etc. The Syrian community in Turkey is over 4 million. But we have also another refugees in Turkey. Uh, I mean, the, the, the refugee uh, in another different, uh, uh, how can I, uh, identity or status in Turkey is over 320,000. It is all very new in Turkey and then it is uh, really very difficult to, to, to uh, uh, manage uh, whole the situation. And uh, end of our uh, 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 organization, I will also share my slides and then you can see also easily. And then most importantly is the social cohesion issue in Turkey because it looks like the Syrians will stay forever in Turkey. And then because of that, it is really very difficult to manage uh, the process. Uh, Syrians live with Turkish society together in big cities. Uh, it is also a huge challenge. And then every day uh, we see also the tendency to the politicization of this process. And then it will also make a pressure to the government. Of course, the economic situation in Turkey is also another part of the issue. And then this situation will also affect on Turkish EU relations and then the position of the EU. And of course, the EU perspective is very uh, significantly. Uh, we in uh, during our survey, we heard a lot of never again 2015, and then it was for us a little bit surprising because we say that never again 2011. Uh, 11. Uh, but uh, I think the crisis began uh, first for the Europeans 2015. Uh, at that time, in Turkey, we had more than 2.5 million uh, refugees, but. It is a little bit Eurocentric, we've, but we know that a little bit. And then uh, Turkey EU uh, uh, statement, it was of course very important step for Turkish EU relationship, more than migration issue. And uh, we cannot also ignore the, uh, the uh, domestic political issue in Turkey uh, and especially between uh, Mr. Davutoglu and uh, President Erdogan. It was also a part of this agreement. Um, the Didem Danish, one of the uh, uh, important uh, migration experts uh, in Turkey, she gave them three points of this, uh, what does it mean, uh, this agreement? And then she said that it is an, uh, a signal for glo global inequalities and relations of asymmetric powers, externalization, and then instrumentalization. And actually it covers all uh, the meaning of the uh, uh, deal or statement in uh, 18th of March. Of course, uh, if we talk uh, with Europeans, they said that it's a success story because of the number of the refugees uh, to, uh, to uh, go to European countries. And then of course, uh, also the disaster, I mean, that number. It is clear, uh, really it's a success story for stop the migration flow or refugee flow to European countries. But what about the other uh, part? 
it is a little bit problematic. As the other uh, speakers and then uh, the uh, ambassadors, they said that it was not only uh, an agreement about the uh, migration and, uh, and the refugees, but uh, we had another point, and then we tried to also analyze the other points as uh, visa freedom or custom union or uh, negotiations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, uh, but uh, as the, as the uh, ambassador said that it's a living, uh, living document, it's very important, but it needs uh, to uh, have new uh, chapters. Uh, we try to understand the main findings and then the categorize the also main findings. Uh, the main motivation of the Europeans and then Turkey is uh, really totally others. I mean, for the Europeans, it was, uh, of course, uh, prevent uh, further irregular and uncontrolled movement to make migrants and refugees to Europe. Uh, it was understandable, of course, it was a shock. Uh, and then, as I said, that we heard a lot of the never again 2015, and then it marked an essential moment for the EU. But for Turkey, especially for, um, for Ahmed Daudoglu uh, government, it was very important to have a better relation with uh, EU. It was an uh, opportunity to have to create a new uh, dimension. And uh, actually in 2015, if you look at that, uh, we had a lot of uh, um, summit with Europeans and the documents, et cetera, et cetera. It was for Turkey really very important for have better relations with Europeans. Legal framework is um, uh, very uh, important. Of course, it's a document, it's a statement. It was not an agreement, an international agreement. And, uh, but uh, for Turkey, uh, of course, it was uh, more than a statement, it was somehow an agreement and then uh, in, in political arena. Readmission agreement and then visa liberalization, of course, both of them uh, since 2013 as very important topics in Turkish EU relationship. And then uh, they try to also change some uh, regulation and then uh, make uh, more faster, especially for visa liberalization and the readmission agreement. But uh, it depends on all the situation and the political situation in Turkey. It was not easy. And financial support, uh, for it, et cetera, of course, uh, Turkey gets, unfortunately, not too much support, financial support to other countries from America or uh, China or uh, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. The main support coming from Europeans. But it's also an instrument uh, to keep uh, the Syrians in Turkey and the other refugees in Turkey, it's clear. But without this uh, financial support, would be very difficult in Turkey to, to manage all the process. And resettlement was also a part of the agreement, but uh, unfortunately uh, it was also unsuccessful and um, the resettlement numbers is very, very low. And because of that, the criticism from Turkey is uh, very high. Uh, wish to more closely relationship with EU uh, from Turkish side. And uh, it was also, of course, a very important topic for the Turkish side, but uh, uh, for Europeans, it's clear uh, because of the uh, democratic problems in Turkey and then pr uh, problems with Cyprus and problems with other issues, et cetera, um, it was not easy uh, to forward. And, but for Turkish side, it is very valuable, very important issue. I think if we have a better understanding uh, both uh, sides, and you, we can find some solutions, but the, the position of the Europeans uh, last five, six years, they are concentrated on all, almost only the migration issue. How successful was the statement? Of course, the, it was uh, successful uh, if you look at the, the numbers, um, but um, in uh, Turkey, and then for, if you think about the Turkish EU relationship, and then the effort of Turkish society is very important. It was a disappointing point. And then it gives also more motivation for the anti-Western, anti-European uh, tendencies and then political discourse in Turkey. Uh, new, new path on asylum and migration, actually the Turkish model, I mean, the Turkish EU model was also a part of this EU uh, new pact on asylum and migration uh, uh, mentality. And uh, it's also very clearly and uh, mostly an externalization policy. I think it's also not sustainable. We have to think about that. And crisis testing time, of course, the opening to Greece border, it was also a part of our survey. Um, 
Oh, I can say you, we made uh, 70 uh, uh, interviews and uh, almost all um, Turks or Europeans, they say that it was a mistake. It was a domestic political issue, but it was a mistake. And, um, but the other side, uh, the um, resettlement policy of the uh, Europeans, it creates also this tendency and it gives also the opportunity to the Turkish government to make it. But um, as I said, that nobody said that it's a correct uh, step. Uh, what about the uh, EU Turkey cooperation in Syria? It is almost impossible because of the political situation uh, and in, in Syria and because of the Kurdish problem in this region. And uh, in this uh, aspect, the uh, Turkey and then EU has a uh, totally different aspect. And then it looks very difficult to create a cooperation in Syria. Effect on Turkish EU relationship. I ask, and then we ask always this question whether the EU uh, 18 match agreement or statement um, uh, brings the Turkey close to, to, to uh, EU or uh, in opposite way. In my mind, uh, we have unfortunately in opposite way uh, development. And uh, it's also uh, very pity. Now I will give uh, some point about the policy recommendation, but in between, uh, I give uh, the floor to Laura. Uh, Laura has also uh, around five minutes time uh, to explain the European wave because she made also in Brussels and then the other European countries interviews. And then, uh, then I will give uh, lastly my policy recommendation. Laura, we are uh, to you. Thank you, Murad Hoja, and uh, thank you to GMF uh, for hosting us and for the invaluable input from all the distinguished guests today. I will be uh, completing some of the information that uh, Murad has been sharing um, and also providing uh, a picture, a wider picture of uh, what we have been gathering from the views of the different decision makers, which, by the way, also include uh, NGOs, uh, practitioners, and uh, think tank experts. We wanted to, to enrich the contributions as much as possible, so we discussed uh, the implementation mostly of the EU-Turkey deal at a moment uh, where there have been conversations and going about reviewing it, uh, and, and on that we also gathered some insights, but up to today we still don't have uh, a conclusive um, understanding of what this uh, future agreement will look like. But to, to maybe start with the nature and implementation of the deal, this has been assessed very differently uh, according to the uh, different counterparts, especially from a European perspective or a Turkish one, or when asked about uh, to NGOs. There seems to be a, a lot of unclarity yet about the nature of, uh, of the EU-Turkey deal on migration, whether this was an international agreement, where, whether this was a political bargain uh, that led to this political statement with no legal um, implications and still up to date create some, uh, some difficulties in assessing and, uh, uh, its implementation and its compliance with, uh, with human rights and, and international uh, law. One thing is, uh, is, uh, is clear, this deal has been politicized and one of the reasons why this has, uh, has been uh, the case is because of the externalization of uh, migration policies from the EU side. As it was highlighted before, this marked a point in which uh, the EU was going through an existential crisis. This was due mainly because of a lack of a common EU policy on migration and asylum from the EU side. Now we have this uh, new pact on migration and asylum that has tried to, uh, to give, uh, to better respond to a critical uh, crisis like the one that we uh, that we experienced in 2015, which more than a refugee crisis was a uh, migration, uh, a migration management uh, crisis. But when it comes to the implementation, uh, it needs to be highlighted as well, as it was said by, by some respondents, the unwanted results that this deal uh, resulted in, like the humanitarian crisis in Greece and, and the Greek islands, and also the negative impact it had on EU-Turkey relations, uh, also because of the, the deter deterioration of the political relations between the EU and Turkey throughout 2015 and 16 and, and afterwards. So 
from a Turkish perspective, the deal has been um, has achieved uh, some uh, well-intended results when it comes, if we measure it by the numbers, reducing the numbers of arrivals and numbers of death uh, at the sea. But there's a, a frustration when it comes to delivering on some of the political promises that were made, even if the EU still uh, considers that those were not promises, but rather, I mean, something that could be worked upon uh, in, in parallel with the implementation of, of the deal. But there is, at the moment, still continues to be no alternative to the deal. So cooperation on EU-Turkey uh, migration seems to be still on the table as one of the main uh, only possibilities in light of no other uh, common EU policy on migration that would uh, allow for all these refugees to to come to, to, to Europe or to at least to have uh, uh, more ambitious resettlement quotas uh, from the different EU member states. But this is, of course, there's still a lack of political will from, from many of them. So in a way, uh, there are demands from, from both sides. I mean, resettlement would be something that would need to be increased in the, in the years to come uh, along this renewed or in a way reviewed implementation of the deal because as it was said before as well, some of its elements stopped working or really, or really never worked uh, at its full potential. Uh, but in line with the, with the deal, there's something, uh, there's another aspect that has been praised as the element that has worked the best when it comes to the EU-Turkey deal, and that's the, the facility for, for refugees. And uh, now there is a political commitment to continue delivering financial support uh, to Turkey in that regard. Uh, and um, from all sides, uh, this, this is believed to be one of the key uh, important points. But of course, there's also uh, some of the respondents also highlighted at the need to, for instance, uh, deep, uh, think deeper about the long-term integration of uh, Syrian refugees in, uh, in Turkey. It's, it's been 10 years now since uh, many of them are in the country and uh, there continues to be um, a, an in limbo situation for many of them since uh, the temporary protection status might not be uh, giving them the full, uh, the, the full protection that they would be uh, requiring. So this is a, an ongoing discussion uh, that, that needs to be addressed uh, by, by both sides, but especially from, from the Turkish counterparts on how to uh, provide these uh, Syrian refugees like uh, self-development opportunities and, and ways in they can sustain themselves. And um, the ambassador uh, Bozai hinted about the negotiations undergoing. Uh, I think we are uh, all looking forward to see what will come out of the coming um, rounds of the steering committee of the facility for refugees. But one thing that many respondents highlighted as well is the key role of municipalities in Turkey, because many are at the forefront hosting a large number of refugees and maybe including them in providing a more direct response to the needs of refugees would be something uh, that could be um, encouraged in the future to come as they are direct providers of, of this su support. So that would be all for me. I will hand it over to Murat to uh, go deeper into their recommendations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Laura. And then in between, I have to also thanks to Onur and Frederic. Uh, Kadri, uh, how long uh, every uh, time? Five minutes. Much? Five. Okay, maximum. Okay. And then uh, I'm, uh, I will be also really very happy to hear uh, the other uh, ideas and then comments and then of course of uh, criticism. Uh, for the policy recommendation, um, we have a lot of topics actually, because it's a very complex issue. It is also good to see it is not an, uh, only a an statement or the agreement between Turkey and the EU for migration, but it's a comprehensive issue. And then one point is very important. Developments in the world indicate that the issue of refugees and irregular migrants does not seem to stop in the foreseeable future. In the last decade, the number of Syrians and other refugees in Turkey exceeds 4 million. The number of irregular migrants exceeds over 1.5 million. The number of refugee children born in Turkey only exceeds 700,000 in 10 years. It's all these portray the importance of cooperation between Turkey and EU on refugees. But as I said that, we are talking about the refugees and the migrants, etc. 
but we cannot concentrate on the Turkish EU relationship. It's for us um, very valuable and then very important. And um, cooperation between EU and Turkey cannot be considered independently of Turkey's relation with EU since 2000, uh, 1959. And the fact that is still a country that conducts membership negotiation is very important for us. I say always that uh, maybe the Turkey is not a natural Professor, born. I'm sorry, oh, sorry. to inter interrupt you, but uh, are you following your slides still? Because we cannot see. No, no, no. It. Okay. No, no. I don't want to give uh, slides more and then. Uh, okay. okay. No problem. Sorry, apologies. Okay. No, 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 no. Um, I have an, a, a definition for Turkey about the uh, uh, Turkish EU relationship. And I, I am saying maybe the Turkey is not a natural born European, but we have to see the effort of Turkish state and Turkish society to be European country. And I think it's very valuable. And then Turkey earned Europeanness. It's also valuable for EU and uh, for uh, our peaceful future. Um, the cooperation after 18 March should be revised and developed in a more comprehensive and long-term manner. Uh, we cannot talk only about the financial support. The Turkey EU cooperation cannot be continued only based on refugee and only with financial support. A real sharing of burden and responsibilities requirement of a steady EU and democratic Turkey. Cohesion process is very important. And uh, however, these process both encourage, uh, encourage and permanency and leave a burden on the shoulders of Turkey to a large extent. Here, a significant financial support is also needed. One point is very important. It's also irregular migration uh, to the Turkey. Of course, the Europeans, they are complaining about, especially if we think about the, uh, the, the, uh, the Greek border uh, opening, etc. This this process, they are complaining about uh, Turkey. And then they said that how can the Afghani coming from Afghanistan uh, to Turkey and then uh, the, the, the border uh, cities? We ask also this question, uh, for Turkey. Only uh, one or two percent of the, these kind of irregular migrants, they have opportunities to go to European countries, but the others, they stay forever in Turkey. And because of that, it is not only a problem for Europeans, it's mainly a problem for Turkey. And for our uh, uh, eastern borders, we have a really very huge problem. Turkish government built last five years more than 1,200 kilometer bo uh, uh, border wall. Instead of that, it is not easy to stop them. And it is not a policy of Turkish government to bring the Afghani and then Pakistani to Turkey and then to send to European countries. It will be very foolish, uh, but it is really a problem. We have to also make cooperation with Europeans. How can we make better border uh, controls? And maybe it's also a need. We should talk also with Iran, Turkey, Iran and EU should also talk together about this issue. It's also very important. So a step must be taken by the EU for visa liberalization. It is very symbolic and quite important for taking into concentration with the sacrifice made by Turkish citizens and Turkish taxpayer. It's very important. We cannot hear easily Turkish taxpayer word. It is for me very important. We thanks to uh, European taxpayer always. But if we talk about the Turkey, we talk about or thanks to Turkish government, please. We should also, this terminology, we should also thanks to Turkish taxpayer. It's a very important issue for me, for the democracy in Turkey. Updating the costume union, I cannot understand why it is too problematic. Um, it is also, uh, it would benefit more for the EU. We can also uh, have a more uh, um, sustainable system. And uh, uh, for uh, uh, settlement system, you should have more resettlement numbers. It is really not sustainable. And then uh, the, the keeping the Europeans from the refugees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it is good for the European maybe, but it is uh, firstly not sustainable. Secondly, they satisfy the other countries. And EU own values, international principles, international law, refugee rights should from, from the framework of cooperation on refugees. It's also very important. It is understandable that the EU is concerned about irregular migration movements, but the EU's uh, evidence of responsibility or protection, minimizing resettlement and externalization 
with all in financial support is not also sustainable. Uh, EU-Turkey relations should also maintain and values and principles for both sides, of course for the Turkey also. Turning emerging crises into opportunities for cooperation may be good for both sides, but in instrumentalization of the humanitarian issues should be avoided. Global compact on refugees. Nobody talk about that in Europe. Uh, it's also very interesting, actually. Uh, global compact on refugees should also be taken into account in the sharing of responsibilities between EU and Turkey. And then um, the EU's problems with the current Turkish government do not necessitate ignoring the huge burden on Turkish society. It is also very important for this society. The role of local administration, local governments, Laura uh, also mentioned, it's very important. EU can create a new funding for only for local administration. They have no money, no financial support from central government in Turkey. Uh, they have no money for, uh, for, for projects. And then it will be also good for the democracy in Turkey to give more importance to the local uh, uh, integration policy. Um, the country that suffered the most in the process related to refugees was Turkey in the region and Greece on the EU side. I think, however, the issue of refugees can be a very suitable area for developing common policies and cooperation. It will maybe a chance for a better cooperation for Turkey and EU. And then last, uh, Turkey-EU relations are inherently challenging. The newly added refugee issue is valuable for thinking more comprehensively than for discussion, discussion, discussing Turkey's place in future EU. Let's not forget, despite all the problems, cooperation on refugees continues. As uh, Ambassador said that, it's a living document. This is extremely valuable for the existence of EU and then cooperation Turkey-EU relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Erdogan, and uh, thanks you, and congratulations to all, all of you. Uh, the authors of the report is a really comprehensive report treating not only the migration issues, but the, the other aspect of the EU-Turkey cooperation as well. So uh, now we can move to the third steps and step, and uh, I would like to first give the floor to uh, Günther Zoyfer, who is the head of CUTS and uh, the owner of the, the report, kind of. So you have seven, eight minutes, uh, Günther, over to you. Uh, thanks a lot, Kadri, uh, for the for the invitation uh, and the possibility to, to contribute. And let me first say that we are not the owner of that <laughs> because we, are, we have financed in a way the research, but the research was in full responsibility and uh, with all academic freedom uh, in, in, uh, under the auspicious or under the direction of, of Professor Murat Erdogan. And I'm, I'm personally, uh, I'm not an expert on migration at all, but, and, but I'm personally very happy that uh, the project was carried out successfully. And I should say that I uh, agree with uh, almost all the recommendations uh, now uh, delivered to us uh, by, by, Professor, by Professor Erdogan. Uh, CATS was founded, I think, uh, and we tried to uh, enhance the uh, level of discussion on Turkey. On a European, on a European, on a, on a European level, because I think we all know that Turkey is, at the moment, a very important, still a very important partner for Europe. But at the same time, it's also not easy to to deal with with Turkey, and that Turkey is perceived from a lot of uh, European member countries also as a great as a great challenge. At the same time, I think we see that there are common challenges in the region. Uh, climate change uh, is one of it, and in our uh, what we are funding uh, on projects in the next year, in 2022, climate change plays an, plays an important role, and we are very much hoping that climate change becomes an area of cooperation, also be not only between uh, European countries, but particular between Europe uh, and uh, Turkey, and this has a lot of uh, a lot of dimensions from. Um, uh, environmental issues uh, to energy issues and a particular cadre is also is also working working on on, on these issues uh, I'm also particularly happy to see today that uh, our project has uh, contributed a little at least and I hope uh, this will continue uh, to um, exchange between Turkey and Greece uh, on the issue 
and uh, will 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 enter into into uh, also more more cooperation. And uh, uh, Kemal Bozoy, uh, Ambassador Kemal Bozoy also rightly mentioned that there are other dimensions to it, particularly the uh, possibility of cooperation between, or the prospects of cooperation between uh, Turkey and the EU in Syria. And let me only say that we had also financed the project of the Center of American Policy carried out together with the Istanbul Policy Center that uh, delivered a very detailed uh, report, uh, both of the uh, possibilities of cooperation and of the challenges for cooperation between the EU, the US and Turkey in northern, in northern Syria. Uh, let, me, let me say that we all are, uh, I think we all face a number, a number of challenges. And uh, I think uh, one of these challenges uh, is really, uh, if we see the uh, migration management uh, of, of, or if we look at migration manage, management as from the perspective, or from the perspective, or perspective, sorry, of a joint uh, and uh, um, of, of joint interests of the countries of the region, or if we are looking from the perspective of diverse or even totally contradictory interests of the country of the region, and the Greek ambassador, uh, I think, rightly uh, underlined. Uh, pointing to these communicating vessels uh, that we should look at it as a as a as a as a, as, a, as, a, as an issue where we have a joint interests and where we can only deal uh, with a huge challenge uh, by by cooperation and i think the second challenge for me is if we are looking at the issue from the perspective of short term policy gains or if we are looking uh, at the issue from the perspective of at least a mid term and a sustainable uh, possibility not to solve the migration problem, because I think the problem is of a magnitude that it cannot be solved, it can only, only be managed. And I think this is one of the, of the great challenges we are, we are uh, uh, in, in front of us. And then I think uh, we should also uh, try uh, to refrain uh, of both from setting uh, values and the rights, the rights of refugee absolute on the one hand side and of ignoring uh, values and the rights of, of uh, refugee uh, of the other hand side, because this brings us, uh, this will also not lead us to a solution, but will only um, in a way flame up, flare up uh, the, the, the fight uh, between different countries, but also inside inside our societies. And we see this in, 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 Germany, in Germany, where the uh, party system was in a way shaked up by the huge influx uh, of refugees in 2015. And this was a time when the uh, right wing or extreme right wing alternative for, for Deutschland uh, was in a way created that is still now again uh, with us uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the German, in the German uh, parliament. Uh, let me, I, I don't want to speak too long, but maybe for the, for the overall discussion at the end, uh, I, I would let me share three, three thoughts uh, with you, because there's much uh, naturally uh, debate on, on externalization uh, of, uh, of the refugee uh, question. And uh, to be very frank, uh, I don't see that there is any uh, possibility uh, of uh, quitting uh, this uh, this approach. Uh, I don't see an alternative to it. And quite to the contrary, I see that externalization has started in Europe, but that this as a as a principle, not as a principle, but as a pattern of dealing with refugee issues, uh, has in a way uh, expanded. And when we saw how uh, the question or the the possibility or the, yeah, the question of, of Afghan, of, of refugees from Afghanistan uh, was uh, discussed. But then we saw that, and this is understandable in my, in my uh, opinion, uh, that in, in Turkey, a very similar discussion emerged than uh, it had been uh, started in Europe, namely to try to uh, keep uh, most of the refugees uh, in neighboring countries of the conflict, because this is the only way to effectively dealing, dealing with the countries without shaking up uh, the uh, political system in the, in, the, in the host countries or in the possible host countries. And therefore, I think uh, we should clearly see this and uh, uh, in a way 
get rid of 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 this of this blame game or of using this this term uh, uncritically. A second a second observation is uh, and very much related to this that uh, the Europeans that in Europe and in the Western countries, due to this tendency to externalization, uh, existing law and regulations uh, are in a way both broken, are breaking, the Europe member states are breaking their own law, are breaking Euro European law by pushing back migrants. And at the same time, we see um, uh, in a way uh, preparations for the changing of the law. Uh, for example, not a European member state, but Britain is now uh, in the process of changing the law, uh, granting the right of uh, application of asylum for asylum only to persons who enter the country legally. And we know that the European Commission is also, and I, I think Murat uh, Hoxha knows it much better than me, is also preparing for uh, an amendment of the European law, uh, now introducing a term of a hybrid threat that might allow for, for pushbacks. And we see that Poland has already changed its national law and in a way also in the clear consciousness that it is breaking uh, uh, European law. And therefore, I, see, I think we see a long ten, uh, 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 a tendency, a clear tendency of amending, of amending the law uh, to be able to, uh, or to be able to, in a way, reject um, accusations uh, that the Europeans are, are breaking their law. And this is in line with the tendency of externalization and in a way in line of, of taking of, of looking at uh, migration, not primarily as a legal issue, but as a political issue that again uh, needs uh, or calls for cooperation. Uh, the third uh, and last uh, observation that I would make is also, I think, not, not really surprising of you. I think for you, I think we all see that uh, the migration issue has a tendency really to uh, not to be a, a huge challenge for the EU, but also to, yeah, to lay dynamite at the very foundations, at the very foundations of the EU. And I see a very um, dangerous uh, process uh, or discussion process in the EU, namely that states that are very much in the geographical center of the EU, as Germany, for example, or as Denmark, or as Holland, are accusing the states at the periphery of breaking uh, the European law, for example, Greece, uh, but also, uh, 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 Turkey, when it comes uh, how if, to pushbacks and when it comes to uh, the treatment of migrants, but are themselves not able to organize uh, an equal distribution uh, of migrants uh, in, 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 in the whole of Europe or of accepting uh, a, lot of, a lot of migrants. And this is a kind of, of, of uh, of a blame game inside inside the European Union that uh, I think is very dangerous uh, for, for the future of the European Union. And I think the, the contrary is also, is also difficult. Now we saw that the new German government is trying to uh, formulate a more principled uh, policy, both when it comes to migration, uh, but also when it comes uh, to foreign policy at all. But the question is, uh, how much the new German government will be able to carry on with this principal policy? To give only one example, now I think the the uh, new German Minister of Interior has announced uh, that uh, out of the forty thousand uh, Afghan refugees uh, that the European Union has, uh, in a way, decided uh, to take in, uh, Germany alone will take in twenty five thousand of of these migrants, and this naturally is an act of uh, human uh, of a human humanitarian act, but at the same time, it is contravening uh, and contradicting the overall aim of the new German government, namely to work for a share, uh, for a fair and equal distribution of, of migrants. And some of the member states are already or since long are accusing uh, Germany with a kind of welcoming policy to create a pull factor uh, of, of migration. What I wanted to say that uh, it is really necessary to see uh, the migration uh, issue as an issue that calls for cooperation, that is only manageable uh, when we are getting rid of, of the blame game between countries, but also uh, inside the European Union. And I think the sober and fact-based uh, report of uh, Professor Erdogan and his team 
uh, it will much contribute to such a, a more fact-based and, and sober discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Günther. I'm sure we, uh, after can, uh, Professor Kirschi, the authors, they will also uh, reflect on uh, your comments. Uh, so, uh, Professor Kirschi is joining us uh, from DC. It's really early, and, uh, and we are really thankful for his efforts to do to make it at that hour. Uh, Professor Kirschi, over to you. Good morning from DC. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, event, fascinating event, I need not to underline it. I also had an opportunity to read the draft form of the, uh, of the report. I sincerely hope, uh, coming on the heels of the remarks made by uh, Gunther, that it is taken seriously and then somehow it impacts policy making as well. Uh, time is very limited, so I'm going to uh, limit my remarks to, I believe, the fourth or fifth question that the report uh, ad addresses. How is it possible to move this cooperation towards a more sustainable, uh, sustainable pers uh, perspect perspective? <clears throat> The, the report itself, as Murat has uh, briefly summarized, offers a wide range and a, a rich list of recommend, uh, recommendations. I would like to add my own for which I've been fighting for since February 2020, just before the pandemic uh, be, be began. The Syrian refugees' uh, presence in Turkey, not to mention, of course, Lebanon and Jordan as well, has become protracted with no durable solutions in the UNHCR sense of, uh, of the word. In other words, they have become either more settled, integrated, or harmonized, whichever uh, term is, is uh, chosen as the more politically correct, uh, correct uh, one. One aspect of this becoming settled, integrated, or harmonized is uh, sustainable and formal employment moving, uh, moving forward. Now there are challenges in front of getting there. One of the challenges is uh, what Kadri Tashtan has uh, written in his GMF report about Erdogan's gamble with the Turkish economy. I need not go into the details of it and I hope that this panel and audience appreciates what that challenge is in terms of helping the Syrian refugees access to livelihood. But in the report, I also detected a number of challenges coming from uh, the European side. In the recommendations, uh, uh, the, the report clearly states that, that financial contributions in the long run is not sustainable on its own. But what I am even more concerned is that in the report, if you go to footnote 76, one uh, official that is not named talks about cutting the rope at some point. The rope of, uh, uh, it's not clear whether it's the rope of financial assistance or the rope of cooperation in the general sense of the word that Gunther uh, re uh, referred to. This leads me to, to underline that the notion of cooperating with respect to finding formal and sustainable livelihood for the refugees becomes even more important. Now, Frit Franz, if you study their uh, allocation carefully, has increasingly moved in that direction in the direction of supporting projects to increase the likelihood of access to livelihood. What has those programs or projects taken? Uh, what form have they taken? They've taken the form of uh, language, uh, language courses, vocational courses, and this fascinating idea of somehow uh, encouraging the private sector to employ uh, re uh, re re refugees. 
Now, for those of you who are familiar with the details of these exercises, can go to the 3RP uh, monitoring reports, and there you will actually see uh, uh, empirical data on the number of uh, Syrian refugees that have become employed, and in the formal sustainable sense of the word, as a result of these projects. And unfortunately, though I regard, at, uh, I regard these projects as highly valuable, the outcome has been increasingly limited. What can we do about it? Uh, Murat Ojam has already flagged the, uh, the Global Compact on Refugees. The Global Compact on Refugees, without going into the details of it, does also offer a wide range of policy tools. Uh, one of them that struck me as soon as the uh, compact was adopted late in uh, 2018 is this notion of trade facilitation to four countries that are hosting large number of refugees in return for those countries enabling for the refugees access to their formal labor market. One manifestation of this, which has had a spotty re record, but I still consider it as an important one, is the EU Jordan, Jordan Com Compact. Time is limited, so I won't go into the details, uh, details of it. But more recently, I have come across a number of report reports suggesting that the idea could be adopted in the context of EU Turkish statement or going beyond it. And one of them is a report to which uh, Murat Oca and I had an opportunity to contribute by the World Refugee and Migration Council, which advocates, beside other uh, ideas, the, uh, the trade facilitation option for Turkey, Jordan, and Le Lebanon. What could this be? One area that could be explored by both sides, the EU and Turkey, is to see if trade facilitation or compromises could be offered in the area of the agricultural sector. No need to go into the details, but customs union doesn't cover agricultural goods, and much more importantly, doesn't cover the agricultural part of processed agricultural goods, like biscuits and gofrets, as I, I, uh, I tend to give as, uh, as uh, ex examples. Now, trade facilitation in this area could encourage the private sector. And I think the we have to recognize that the private sector is not a philanthropic player, that it will engage Syrian refugees, employ them, if there is benefit for them in, uh, in it uh, as well. And a second area where the idea could be implemented with the cooperation of both sides, Turkey and the European Union, is industrial zones, the kind of industrial zones that were adopted for those of you who are old enough to remember uh, the, uh, the Arab-Israeli peace process from the early uh, 1990s when the US government uh, made it possible for such uh, industrial zones to emerge in Egypt, Palestine, and Jordan and export their goods favorably with the understanding that it would contribute to the peace process. Here, a similar idea could be adopted not just in the case, uh, for the EU because of the customs union, but more so for developed uh, industrial countries like United States, Australia, Japan, Korea, uh, et, uh, et cetera. And here, the principle would be that companies that are willing to operate in this industrial zone and benefit from the uh, trade advantages that would come uh, would employ Syrian refugees formally. Of course, as the Global Compact on Refugees very importantly underlines, these arrangements also have to benefit the host community. So to, re to, to, to conclude Kadri Ojam, without hopefully overrunning uh, my time uh, uh, limits there, is that 
this arrangement could create what one would call a win for Turkey, creating employment for, for refugees by, and relieving the pressure on uh, what Murat Hocam underlined, taxpayers' uh, sacrifice, uh, sacrifices. It would enable uh, the Syrian refugees to contribute to the uh, Turkish uh, economy by their labor, by their consumption, by their tax payments. Uh, and then second win, it would benefit the European Union. I need not go into the details of uh, why I think both Günther and Murat by emphasizing and Laura by emphasizing externalization and the politics behind it would make it a, a, a win. And it would be a win obviously for Syrian refugees who are in a precarious situation right now in the labor market and like the rest of the Turkish uh, laborers, workers will find themselves in an even more precarious situation as we move, uh, as, uh, we move uh, for, uh, uh, forward. These are my, this is one I, idea I've had for some time, and I really would like to see Brussels, Berlin, and maybe other capitals uh, capitals policy circles, but also civil civil society and think tank circles, picking up this idea, maturing it and pushing it uh, forward uh, in spite of some resistance that may came, might come from the Turkish side as well as e the uh, EU side. Thank you very much. Kemal Ojam, thank you so much uh, for those uh, really valuable insight and uh, inputs and also really concrete recommendations that are really important. And uh, Günther also mentioned the climate issues because obviously the mismanagement, corruption, security issues, uh, many drivers uh, for migration and the climate issue will all, all, only worsen all this, uh, this situation and the, the reality with, will be with us. And so the key is really the uh, integration. Uh, and obviously there's a link uh, uh, related questions uh, from the audience. So I want to bring this question uh, from Anne Kael. Is ask, she's asking, uh, what are the main problems of the refugees locate, local integration in Turkey? And another question from her, how many refugees could voluntarily return to their home country? And what kind of condition, financial, other should be ensured for them? Well, I, I suppose that she's asking about the refugees who are in Turkey, otherwise it's not uh, uh, very clear to me. So uh, maybe uh, you can start by uh, answering this question, but it's also occasion to maybe reflect on uh, on uh, what has been said until now uh, during the meeting on uh, Ambassador YouTube. Please uh, feel free to uh, chime in. Uh, maybe we can start with this first question, uh, Professor Erdogan, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Kadri. A local integration issue is very important in Turkey. Uh, it is actually for all integration process, the local governments and then NGOs, they play a very important role. But in Turkey, we have uh, for both uh, elements, both instruments, uh, traditionally uh, a lot of problems. I mean, the NGOs cannot uh, uh, move easily. And also the local governments, they have no source, no capacity, no money. It is very important, but there are there is very important reality. The Turkish government, the beginning of the process in 2011, 12, 13, they thought that uh, it's, it's a temporary issue and then the, the Syrian will go back. And because of that, the Turkish government didn't make any settlement system in Turkey. And then the refugees, um, especially the Syrians, they decide themselves where they want to live, they move there. And then now we have a huge uh, differences between uh, cities, also districts level, also, also the neighborhood. And then it is also a necessity to make a local integration process. If we talk about Ankara and then refugees, only three districts we can talk about the refugees. Or in Istanbul, one district has over 200,000 refugees in Esenyurt, for example. But if you go to Beşiktaş, only 5,000. And because of that, it is 
uh, essential to make a local uh, integration process. But what is the need? Firstly, uh, the regulation for the local government, they have to give services to Turkish citizens. It is the regulation in our law. Okay, there is also another point that we can be a little bit flexible, but it will be also more clear to give the services also not Turkish, non-Turkish citizens. And then secondly, uh, more importantly, they gave only the financial support from central governments. I mean, the Turkish government gave the money to the municipalities and uh, only for Turkish citizens and a number of the Turkish citizens. But think about the Kilis, for example, it's very significantly, very interesting city. They have more Syrian refugees than their own society, the, the Turkish citizens. But since 2011, they get the same number, same money from the central government. And then because of that, the local governments, they need immediately more support and then financial support, also initiative. It is also very important. Turkey is very centralistic. Uh, system has a very centralistic system, and because of the Kurdish problem, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's also another political discussion in Turkey. It's not easy to give the uh, municipalities authority, and uh, but we should find a solution. And then my offer is: we have a so-called ESSN support program uh, uh, through the free uh, uh, finance, and maybe the EU can change a system and then give the uh, money not directly to the refugees but direct to the municipalities, of, of course, project-based, but they get money to, uh, to make a project. I uh, have an idea, and then I write also in my report, for example, 10 euro per refugees per month would be huge money for the municipalities to operate their uh, social cohesion project, also the other services. This is a very important issue. Uh, I think uh, uh, it will be also for Turkish democracy good. What about the voluntary return? For me, it is closed. It is, uh, as a migration expert, and, and I am saying since 2015, the Syrians will stay forever in Turkey. Okay, very small part of them, 1%, 2%, they can uh, 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 have maybe opportunity to go to European countries or the other countries, but maybe 1%, 2%, they can go back but the huge part of them, they will stay forever in Turkey. But the Turkish government gave some numbers. The last numbers was over 500,000, but I see also this numbers also not enough realistic. If you look at the UNSCR numbers, last five years, only 100,000 returning. And they have no country to go back. It is a reality. And then secondly, they established their life in Turkey. In Turkey, the born newborn babies numbers I give a lot, but one more time, 700,000. And then visit Turkish schools, public school, learn Turkish. The, uh, the students' number is over uh, 750,000, uh, etc. It is not easy to go back, and voluntary return uh, should not be a priority in Turkey. We should concentrate on the integration policies, and then because of that, the cooperation, financial cooperation is also very valuable. Thank you, Professor. Uh, please feel free to chime in. Uh, but I would like to bring out a question and uh, from one from Omar Katko, is, uh, his question is following. Uh, in light of blame game between the EU and Turkey, what is the silver lining for asylum seekers in Turkey who want to reach Europe? This is the first question. And then, um, there is a, a two other question from Pelin, Pelin Sazak. She's uh, I'm just citing the question. The common challenge is framed as mitigation, mitigating, sorry, the flows of irregular migrant human smuggling. However, given the fact on the ground and several NGOs report, how can the EU and Turkey tackle unintended consequence of uh, criminalization of humanitarian assistance rescue at sea? This is our first question. And the second, uh, for the sake of sustainability of the deal, uh, how should we contextualize the justification of human rights violation under the excuse of national security concern? And she was given this uh, uh, famous 2020 uh, Turkish Greek uh, tension. Um, okay. Uh, Kadri, I think Laura can uh, give the answer for the first question. 
And if uh, Frederick or Onur is ready, they can also give the other answers and then they can also give contribution. And then firstly, uh, Laura, uh, can you give the, uh, your uh, opinion about this first question? I think you possible? mentioned two other, uh, two, two other author that they can, I don't, because I don't believe that the, the, the audience cannot really join us. I ah, yes, okay. Okay, then, then okay. <laughs> I understand, sorry. Uh, Let, then, uh, Dora, okay. then I, I will give also my uh, response and then maybe the Hilo also can uh, give uh, some. Go ahead, Laura. Please. Yeah, okay. Laura. Thank you. Yes, I think the two questions are, are very much uh, interlinked in a way and they point uh, to the fact that there has never been a focus on the, uh, on the human rights or the rights of uh, refugees and, and migrants. And this has been a constant uh, criticism from uh, from NGOs that this has never been taken in, into account somehow when it comes to the scrutiny of the implementation of the deal and the uh, unwanted uh, consequences that it has uh, created. Uh, this is also related to the fact that there's no legal basis of the deal that uh, can be brought somehow uh, in front of, uh, it was tried in front of a court, but this was, it didn't really deliver uh, much results. But at the moment, uh, as long as uh, there's no more political will coming from the, from the member states uh, in the EU, and also uh, there's not a mechanism for bigger responsibility sharing, which I prefer not to call it like burden sharing, but rather responsibility uh, sharing, there's no silver lining. I mean, I don't see how we, we are seeing how the dev developments in uh, internal borders of the EU are happening at the moment between uh, Belarus and, and Poland and some other minor uh, politically fabricated uh, crisis involving refugees and migrants. I think uh, this EU-Turkey deal that was meant as a temporary measure in a crisis situation years ago, I mean, we are now, it has been more than five years since this, um, these events happened and still we couldn't come up with a comprehensive response where we can give a more humanitarian response to uh, what is happening in, in our borders. And this is part somehow um, of, uh, it's, it's a failure of the uh, solidarity of the different member states, I would say, not necessarily the EU. I mean, there's an ambition to, uh, to make the resettlement numbers higher. And uh, from what we understood in our interviews, there is really there are really plans to, to make this uh, resettlement a yearly exercise and to bring the numbers up. But we shouldn't forget as well that there was this voluntary humanitarian uh, admission scheme within the EU-Turkey deal that was never activated. And this could be something that would, would give like a, a positive sign of continuing this cooperation between uh, Turkey and the EU. This has been highlighted previously by the uh, Greek ambassador, by the Turkish ambassador as well, and uh, by many of our interviewees that cooperating with uh, Turkey on migration is, is still necessary. Uh, this doesn't mean that the only solution is the EU-Turkey deal as it stands now, my, but it's, it can be one instrument but of course it's uh, up to uh, the EU member states as well and the EU institutions to come up with more sustainable uh, solutions that can give a response to these pro protected uh, conflicts in our vicinity. And also because this uh, migration phenomenon uh, is, is not gonna be ending anytime soon. So this requires not only cooperating with third countries but also a more ambitious and more solidarity between our member states. Thank you, Laura. Uh, uh, over to you, uh, if we could also keep a bit briefly the answers, maybe uh, other speakers also can have. Uh, yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would like to also intervene about the question on the sustainability of the deal and how they could contextualize the justification of human rights violation, especially this was also one of our main uh, point that we discussed with our interviewers, especially I tried to cover the Council of Europe part as I had many experiences there. What is really interesting for me to hear that, of course, they all criticize that there is a human rights violation, especially in the uh, interp interpretation of the deal, there is a human rights violation as well. But the way to not repeat them again is just to wish that Turkey will never again open the borders and uh, the Greek side will never react in that sense. But there is no much more concrete you know, strategy from EU or Council of Europe. European side 
to manage the tissue, it was also interesting for me. And uh, what was also, I think, uh, this uh, that we need to discuss, because there are many questions about the irregular migration, the control of the irregular flows, uh, which is also main point of the new EU pact, uh, new EU migration policy. This was also interesting from our side to see that both from the Turkey side and EU side or European side, this new pact is quite unknown. Uh, maybe there is a general over under very overall understanding saying that ah oh, there's a new strategy, uh, extended strategy, and EU will continue to uh, uh, manage this migration phenomenon. But what is in detail? So how they could manage it? How you could criticize the uh, deal? Uh, not the deal. Uh, the migration uh, package, new package. It was something uh, unknown. So uh, on the one hand, maybe it should be EU Commission. So again, discuss if they really try to give the message with this migration uh, pact uh, package, or on the other hand, it should be also critical to see if there is a really new, uh, you know, uh, path on migration management process, especially uh, to control the irregular migration. That's also uh, questionable, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Nial Hocam. Thank you so much. Murat Hocam, I will give you the, the floor again, but uh, there's a question in the, the chat is uh, from Alexander Karapiperis. You have already answered partially this question. Mm -hmm. It's mentioning the distance between uh, Iranian-Turkish border mm -hmm. and Turkish Greek border and uh, given this, uh, you know, in, given this distance is uh, questioning how, how can we interpret this unimpeded mm -hmm. access of hundreds of thousands of people every year to the EU border is this is mentioned I'm just citing him is that implying the un uncover involvement of Turkish status or his uh, accepts the acceptance to instrumentalize human uh, mm -hmm. suffering in order to extract political gains from the EU uh, this is his question of course uh, ambassador uh, you, you can also if you like uh, I, I would like to give them uh, very briefly about the question. It is really a very important question, but it will be uh, very nice to think that uh, Turkey uh, brings uh, some people to Turkey to make uh, more pressure to the European countries. We have more than enough. It is not a need, and it makes also really huge trouble for the government. Now the current government, AK Party government, they have a lot of problems. They have, um, we discuss a lot in Turkey, economic situation, political situation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, believe me, the most important issue is one of the most important issues is irregular migration in Turkey. And then it makes huge uh, pressure to the government. And they try to also stop that. But since 2014, they are coming to Turkey mostly from Iranian border. And we understood in between we need better relations with our neighbors. If you have uh, not good relations with their neighbors, then you have also, especially in our region, we have always problems. But it is, it, it is uh, too much to say that uh, Turkey brings the people uh, to make pressure. As I said, that we have more than enough. And then one, uh, another question, I say, see that, and then I'm saying that, and then uh, I, will, I will also finish. For next future, it is exactly that. The EU-Turkey deal is very limited to the Syrian refugees and then for a, for a uh, very short period. But we will see more crisis in this region. And then because of that, and sustainable relations, Turkey EU relations is for all very important because of that, this uh, report, we try to also give some impulse for the better and sustainable relations. It's not should be membership, et cetera, but better relations we can also have, I think. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, Ambassador, please, if you want to uh, comment on this. And, uh, Professor and so then, first of all, uh, Murat Hoca made a very clear answer to that. And when we have uh, an extra four and a half million next to Syrian border, there are two million Afghanis in Iran. And then there is no way that this is a, a state policy or something. And you know, uh, there's a security uh, aspect of this. When these refugees are coming or asylum seekers, there's a risk, a risk and there were attacks, terrorist attacks in Turkey and uh, we cannot uh, have uh, any uh, tolerance to that. 
And you know, uh, these numbers are big numbers. They are the refugees that uh, or asylum seekers we have in Turkey uh, are bigger than so many states in, in Europe. Anyway, but I would like to make another comment based on what Nihal Hoca, Günter, and also Murat Hoca mentioned. I'll also combine it what Laura and Kemal Christi said. The main issue, it's bigger than what we are discussing. The main issue that 1951 UN Convention is not enough anymore because the conditions have changed and the refugee understanding or the rights, as Günther put it uh, very rightly forward, uh, rights and values of refugees, asylum seekers are changing. And the danger here, as I mentioned, for the sake of having a fortress Europe to fill this gap and to make some uh, you know, arrangements which are not very uh, beneficial or which are uh, omitting the rights and uh, values related with the asylum seekers. And this pact, which as I mentioned, which uh, 18 March gave a birth, uh, is an important document we should work on because there are so many flaws in it. Pre-screening process, health issues, and it is all other uh, dimensions mentioned in this document are arbitrary measures. And this is very dangerous. And this might bring us to a very you know, uh, difficult situation as we are, I, I mentioned, the European Union that we would like to remember is based on values and principles. And the use of this far right uh, side of the uh, political picture spectrum in the European Union is benefiting a lot. And it is not only populism, it is nativism. And this is very dangerous. And in that sense, we need to work on all these things. Another thing, thing Günther uh, underlined, and then it is very important, climate issue. We can have walls, we can have some uh, wires, but we cannot, uh, we cannot prevent the uh, forest place, tornadoes, and uh, sea pollution, air pollution. And this is also something that it needs a good cooperation. And also, there was a question by Mustafa Ulusoy about Turkey's stability up post-COVID time. And EU, uh, when uh, the COVID started, the first uh, phone call I got from the commission was to establish a task force in order to uh, have the supply chain. Uh, and because supply chains were broken and then there was a big need in Europe. And then we made a, co a task force together with the EU authorities. And in that sense, post-COVID period, because of the changes and the, the, the transformation it will bring uh, through trade, through other uh, you know, financial arrangements, uh, needs a better cooperation, better coordination between EU and Turkey. If EU would like to have the standards setting situation and the power uh, for this transformation, especially in the Green Deal and other things, in digital uh, transformation. And when having engaged with Turkey and keeping the accession process, EU has a strategic uh, guidance to give Turkey. This is very important. Uh, and this, is, this, is, this shouldn't be lost. And Kemal Hoca uh, also uh, you know, uh, brought us another dimension of returns. It is related with what Laura said and others. Uh, in order to uh, make dignified, voluntary, and uh, secure returns, we need to provide them a life, uh, life, livelihood. Yes, and in that sense, this is only possible by creating these kind of projects. This is why I also underlined Article Nine of Eighteen March uh, by having this uh, in our minds. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Let me to bring another question, and then we have almost five minutes, so you will have uh, all two, three minutes, maybe to. Uh... To, to comment also this question. Uh, Ian Anthony is asking how can arrangement be uh, future proof? Uh, Syria may be a frozen conflict with us for decades uh, with a constant risk of escalation and new displacement. So the experts on migration say that the large scale movement of the people in the future is inevitable. How, how can the EU and Turkey prepare together for the long term? This is his uh, question. Maybe I can start with you. Uh, Yes. 
that's a tough question to uh, to address and to provide a concrete answer uh, with. Uh, uh, in the light of what has been said so far in the Q&A session, I'd like to tie it up with the very first question from Omer Katköy about the silver lining issue, which many of you, including Laura, openly uh, address. Let me say uh, I'm a traditionalist, conservative in the sense of remaining loyal to the letter and spirit of the 1951 convention as far as uh, asylum seekers and refugees go. I have listened to remarks that uh, highlight the way in which there is growing pressure on governments to reform the 51 convention, although I have no idea what the reform form would, uh, would uh, look, uh, look like. And then there are internal dynamics that are that are so conspicuous in uh, in these countries, EU member countries, but beyond. Gunther's reference to the UK preparing legislation that only asylum seekers that enter into UK legally, to me, is absolutely frightening. Absolutely frightening. And last week there was the. Uh, the summit for democracy led by Biden, five hours of speeches approximately I listened to, and no one, unless I missed out on a detail, referred to the rights of asylum seekers and refugees as inscribed in the United Nations Declaration of uh, hu Human Rights dating back to the aftermath of the Second World War, not to mention the 1951 uh, 51 convention. When Gunther mentioned the UK, I couldn't help, maybe I'm the only one who remembers those days, uh, remember the 1994 November uh, regulation that Turkey adopted precisely with the same principle as the one that the UK may be uh, adopting, that you have to have entered legally uh, and apply within a Five days it was, it wasn't even a, a, a week. And from there, the European Union and the UNHCR engaged Turkey in a very constructive manner and brought it to the point where the 2013 law was adopted. I won't go into the details of it. I'm just underlining this, how not only the UK, but the European Union and the rest of the so-called democratic countries are going back to where Turkey was in 1994. And I find that terribly frightening. If you are letting go of your very basic norms and values uh, 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 and, uh, and not applying these principles and values to the most vulnerable in, uh, in the society, in the general sense of the word, not just national societies, then I'm afraid, let's call it the West, is not moving in the right direction. And I'm very sorry to say that Biden's effort to mobilize the West against the alternative ways of governance that China and, uh, and Russia are uh, advocating is, is, going to, is going to prevail. This is the context in which I am seeing the issue of uh, asylum seekers access to, to apply to asylum, not to necessarily receive it, but at least the right to apply uh, for it. And then comes the rights of the refugees. This is the broadest context in which I see uh, those. Uh, I, I hate to be pessimistic, but the op optimistic pay, uh, aspect of it is if we work from bottom up, adopting practical ideas and step by step, small steps, we try to move in, the, uh, in, in a constructive direction. And I think this report and other reports have very valuable uh, policy ideas in it that ought to be taken up and pushed for, forward. Thank you so much, uh, Kamal Ojan. 
Uh, Günther, over to you. Briefly, uh, your concluding remarks also, and you can also maybe comment on this question if you want. Go ahead, please. No, I think it is very difficult uh, to speak after after Kemal, Kemal Hoxha and particular uh, underlining uh, with so much uh, emphasis uh, the necessary of, of, of sticking of sticking to, to rights and, and, and humanitarian concerns. And uh, let me first say that uh, it, it referred to what, what the Greek ambassador said, uh, that uh, it was in a way uh, necessary or at the end of the day positive that uh, the effort of, of, of Turkey to, to channel migrants uh, into Greece, uh, Greek's territory in uh, February last year, uh, did not prevail because if this had would have prevailed, then the uh, refugee cooperation would not have continued. And this is a kind of absurd situation that, uh, in a way, uh, uh, the breaking of the, 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 the break of the rule of law uh, in, enabled uh, the continuation of, of, of cooperation. And uh, this is, I think, we all have to, or at least I, I, I admit that I'm in a in a in a in a in a, in a moral uh, quandary and uh, because uh, naturally it is it is easy and not not easy it's understandable and from an ethical point of view necessary uh, to underline what what Kemal Kirishchi has said but uh, as far as I know and since only a detail the uh, Geneva uh, Convention uh, did not does uh, has not the, the non refoulement principle but it does not grant uh, the right of individual application it is EU law, uh, EU law that grants the right of every asylum uh, seeker to uh, individual application, to, to my knowledge. And uh, we see that uh, in, in, in the European countries, if you have accepted an asylum seeker and starting uh, an application process, then no matter uh, if this application process on the on the on, on the bulk of the of the cases uh, how this application process end the asylum seeker will stay in the country uh, because it is very difficult uh, to uh, uh, take persons out of the country after the uh, asylum application is rejected and this is a very practical problem that is used by right wing forces uh, to uh, uh, propagate uh, against the government and against uh, the law of asylum seekers at all. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, the, uh, I see uh, the future that there will be some kind of, uh, what I said, of weakening of asylum, of the rights of asylum seekers. There will be, as I think, there will be uh, uh, solutions of, uh, of contingents uh, of uh, Western states, of uh, wealthy states, that in a way are in a way declaring their uh, readiness to accept a particular number of asylum seekers, but I fear that in the long in the long run this is uh, the uh, uh, solution uh, we are we are uh, moving on, and uh, because what we what I see at the moment is that those who are in a way fighting uh, for the rights of asylum seekers and those who uh, want to do uh, the rights of asylum seekers away at all. Is in a way blocking. Is in a way blocking uh, the the uh, any solution, any sustainable solution of the block of the of the uh, problem in the in the midterm. But uh, if I was wrong with what I said about the Geneva Convention, please Kemal, uh, uh, correct me. Oh, thanks. Uh, I, I'm terribly sorry about Gun Gunther. I, I think there I say you you were wrong on the 1951 okay. con convention. And the 51 convention has to be read and understood hand in hand with the UN Declaration on Human Rights. The UN Declaration, as you said correctly, grants, grants uh, access to asylum, the right to seek asylum. And then it is, it is individual states that process it and if the uh, reason for the application of the asylum falls within the definition of the 1951 convention, persecution basically, then the state uh, grants the right of uh, becoming a refugee in that country. And then the 51 convention in uh, 
in, in, in detail defines what the rights of the refugees are, offers the three durable solutions as possible uh, avenues to, to follow, and then also lists the obligation of refu refugees towards uh, the state that uh, they have. You are right that the 51 convention does not lay out the way in which the, the asylum seekers whose application has been rejected, what do you do about it is not defined in the 1951 con uh, con convention. Thank you so much uh, for clarification. I'm, I'm really sorry, we are, we are, it's already two o'clock and unfortunately uh, I will not be able to give the, you again the floor. But uh, I just, I would like to thank you, all our speakers for joining in us and making really this converse, conversation work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Bozai. Thanks for joining uh, Professor Erdogan and Günther. Uh, Laura, uh, Kemal Hocam, Nial uh, Hocam, thank you so much. And I would like to also thank the Greek ambassador, uh, uh, Ambassador Vraidas. And of course, uh, thanks to Kat for, for this uh, cooperation. And let me to thank also my colleague, Anika, who helped to put all this together. And thanks to my colleague, Alberto, who helped us with the Zoom issue. And and above all, thanks to all of you have joined, who have joined us and thank you and hope to see you uh, soon again. And of course, when the, uh, the report will be published, you can find it on the uh, CUTS uh, SWP website. Uh, have a nice day, have a nice afternoon. Uh, see you soon again. Thank you.